title of our sermon this morning is Walk by Faith. Walk by Faith. And we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, specifically in verses 6 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. As we introduce our text and think through what Paul is describing, teaching, instructing in our text, I want you to consider with me for a moment what a gift we have in God's Word. What a gift the Bible is. What a blessing God's Word is. It is a tremendous act of grace, a tremendous act of mercy that Almighty God, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, has chosen to reveal Himself to His creatures through His Word. The Bible, the Bible is God's good and gracious self-disclosure and Hebrews 1, having spoken at various times and in various ways to the fathers by the prophets, God has in these last spoken to us by his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. That glorious revelation of God, that glorious self-disclosure that we have on the pages of Scripture, comes to us in three primary forms. And you'll find in this book, God's Word, you'll find law. That which God commands, that which God condemns, or that which God commends. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, for example. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're commanded to fear the Lord. The commands of God lead to a fear of God. Generally, with God's law, there are warnings, there are sanctions attached by which we learn to fear Him. The Proverbs also say, Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, warning, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. It's often through those good, just, and holy sanctions that we learn to fear God. Secondly, not just law, but secondly, testimony. A testimony of God, information about God, information about God's people, their nature, their character, conduct, and specifically information about God, what we are to believe, what we are to know about him. Proverbs chapter 9 verse 10 goes on to say, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding, right? We gain true understanding, true wisdom comes from knowing God. And we know God through his revealed word, through his gracious self-disclosure. Thirdly, there are promises in the Bible. Promises. There are certainly God's promises of judgment upon the wicked. And if you are outside of Christ here today, there is a promise of God that if you do not turn from Christ, you will suffer the fires of hell forever. Right? That's a promise of God of judgment upon the wicked. But there are many, many promises given To God's people, precious promises of God to his people, whereby God encourages us, comforts us, leads us, preserves us, bolsters our faith, gives us joy, gives us hope, precious promises. Now, God, as perfectly holy, perfectly holy, would have been just, would have been right to have remained aloof from us. To have been far off, so to speak, separate from sinners. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. In love and in grace and mercy, because we are undeserving sinners, God chooses to relate to his people. He chooses to fellowship, so to speak, with his creation. He condescends in that way. He stoops to fellowship with his people. Psalm 95, verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his very hand, right? However, we consider the word of God. In order to relate to us as his people, God must do far, exceeding and above, more than merely giving us this book, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, 
because they are spiritually discerned. We are unable, apart from God, unable, apart from the work of the Spirit, to understand that which is spiritually discerned. We're unable to understand His Word, unable to understand His revelation. You may think, I know what it means. It's not far enough. The natural man's delight is not in the law of the Lord. The natural man does not rejoice in the way of his testimonies. And the natural man dies apart from faith, not having the promises. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14. The mind of a lost man apart from Christ is blinded. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Satan, the god of this age, the ruler of this world has blinded his mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. The natural man walks in the futility, the hopelessness of his mind. In Titus chapter 1, verse 15, even his mind and conscience are defiled. All people outside of the saving work of God in Christ are dead in trespasses and sins, alienated and enemies of God in their minds by wicked works. So, God then, to relate to his people, must redeem fallen man. God must redeem us, save us from the error of our sins, save us from the penalty of our sins, save us from his holy and just wrath, which would separate us for all eternity, making us objects of his wrath. We must be made alive in Christ. Those who were once dead must be made alive in Christ, born again by His Spirit, granted repentance and faith through the preaching of the gospel, forgiven of sin, reconciled to God, justified and made righteous in Christ. God says then, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Right? I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. It's through the work of God's spirit, right? It's through this work of regeneration, the new birth, that we are given spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear, a mind to understand spiritual things. That's the only way in which the once natural man becomes spiritual and able to understand God's regenerate people with the indwelling Holy Spirit leading them into truth are those who experience the word of God as living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. But apart from Christ, apart from his spirit, it's a closed book. Right? For those who are dead in sins and trespasses, it's closed revelation. So then, regarding that gracious threefold self-disclosure in the Bible... One, it's then, upon the new birth, that we delight in God's law, right? We acknowledge ourselves to be the vile sinners that we are, and we see his law as holy, just, and good. We have the desire then, and by his spirit, we have the ability to obey it. Two, it's then, upon the new birth, upon regeneration, that we rejoice in his testimonies where we see Christ as exceedingly precious, worthy of worship, praise, honor, faith, obedience, devotion. Three, it's then, and only then, through new creation eyes that we see spiritual realities, where we lay hold by faith to the promises that are ours in Christ Jesus our Lord, where we fix our gaze on unseen things eternal in the heavens. Right? That's the context then in which the Word of God is brought to bear on the life and faith of a genuine believer. When one is truly born again, one is genuinely saved, then that's when the Word of God truly becomes a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Right? It becomes a guide that governs, a guide, a, His Word that governs our life. That's where we see Christ. And we see Christ then in the Scriptures. And beholding Christ in the Scriptures, we are transformed into His image. We're sanctified, right, by the Spirit, through the Word. We're transformed into His image from one degree of glory to another degree of glory. And as the faithful 
born again, spirit indwelt disciple of Christ, reads and studies and meditates on Scripture. Right? This is a his revelation given to us in the form of a book. Right? It requires that we read and we study and we meditate. He calls us to read and to study and to meditate. And as the faithful, born-again Christian reads and studies and meditates on the Bible, with his heart prayerfully set on trusting and loving and pleasing Christ, then that good theology, through the work of the Spirit, will fuel and drive and govern that believer's life. There's no mystery to these things, right? The Bible makes it very clear. If you want to grow in Christ, if you want to be a faithful Christian, if you want to walk by faith, if you want to live for him, devoted to him, then it's the Spirit of God through his word preached. It's the Spirit of God through his word read and studied and meditated upon that will fuel and drive and govern your Christian life. It will fuel and drive and govern the preaching of the gospel. And your service in his church. This is no ordinary book. Amen. God's words aren't mere platitudes. Or guidelines for a better life. Right. The spirit of God is at work through his word. If you wanted to be de devoted to the Lord. And be devoted to his word. Be devoted to his revelation. Know of him and the power of his, resurrection, of his resurrection, right? And then know with him the fellowship of his sufferings. God's law, his testimony, and those promises revealed in God's word are intended to be the foundation upon which we live and minister and serve and preach the gospel. Isaiah 55 verse 11 the Lord says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give, give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, says the Lord. It shall not return to me void, says the Lord, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You know, as a, as a genuine Christian with a, with a new heart, a new nature, new desires, indwelt by God's Spirit, you become a willing, joyful, meditating, studying, reading receptacle of God's revelation. And it's through His revelation that He cleanses you and sanctifies you and conforms you into the image of Christ. And if you're in His Word, God promises that His Word will prosper in you. It will prosper in the thing for which I sent it. It will do according to what God has promised it will do. That happens through faith. That happens through faith. Paul understood this in 2 Corinthians. For studying Paul's defense of his apostolic ministry, we see also there an apologetic for what a glorious ministry that we have in preaching the gospel. This new covenant ministry that we've all been given. Paul there, in 2 Corinthians, specifically now in chapter 5... Paul delights himself in submitting to the lordship of, of Jesus Christ, submitting to his law, right? He delights himself in obeying what the Lord has commanded. His favorite reference for himself is as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Romans chapter 1, verse 1, for example. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, that necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. If I do this willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, I've been entrusted with a stewardship. I've been given a stewardship. However, given a stewardship, Paul didn't see his ministry, didn't see the command of God to preach the gospel as a begrudging duty. Paul delighted in it. Paul reveled in it. He relished it. He saw it as a great mercy, a great grace from God that he would be called into ministry. He counted it a great joy. He counted it a great privilege. After laboring among the Thessalonians, laboring, Paul told them, you are our crown of rejoicing. Right? What fueled Paul's joy? It's believing the testimonies of God. Hoping, trusting in the promises of God, resting in God's word, right? 
the promise is the revelation of God in Christ. Two, Paul delights himself in the testimony, in the testimonies of God, the testimony of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. His desire is to follow in the steps of his Lord who laid down his life for Paul. So Paul has determined to lay down his life for Christ and his church, even to the point of great suffering and death. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 11. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. Where did Paul get the perseverance, the stick to so to speak, to endure affliction, endure suffering, and persevere in his ministry. Paul delighted in the testimonies of God. Paul delighted in the word of God, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And three, thirdly, particularly with respect to our text, Paul here delights himself in the promises of God. He delights himself in the promises of God. Second Corinthians chapter 4, now verse 17. We know, Paul says, that our affliction in this life, which is light and momentary, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. Paul delighted in the promises of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. We know that even if we give up our bodies in death serving Christ, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So then, Paul continues in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, we are always confident, always confident. Paul, it's obvious in this exposition of Christian ministry, Paul has tapped into a tremendous source of strength, joy, motivation, perseverance, boldness, confidence, and hope as he labors. Right? Paul labors. Paul strives. Paul gives all for the sake of Christ. And what fuels his faith, what fuels and fires his drive, the promises of God, the testimonies of God, the law of God, the fear of God, love for God, hope in God's promises, right? Tremendous source, God's word of joy, strength, motivation, perseverance, boldness, confidence, and hope. You see, Paul's theology revealed by God in his word is brought to bear on Paul's life. Paul's theology, the, the weight of that theology, and the increasing weight of it as he, as he learns more, and he knows Christ more fully, as he serves, and as he's sanctified, right? The weight of that theology has been brought to bear on Paul's life, on the way that Paul thinks about ministry, right? The way that Paul thinks about the way that he lives, his responsibility to God's people, his responsibility to the Lord, his responsibility to lost people in preaching the gospel. All of that good theology is brought to bear on Paul's understanding of those things. And through that good theology in the hands, so to speak, of the Holy Spirit, working in and through the Apostle Paul, Paul could face, no matter his circumstances, right? Paul could face suffering, great persecution, great disappointment, and face it all, saying with confidence, we do not lose heart. Right? We do not shrink back. We are always confident. If you're like me, there are many times when you don't feel confident. <laughs> but Paul's theology, his understanding, you could say, in light of Second Corinthians chapter 4, his sight of eternal and unseen things fueled Paul's labor, fueled his faith, fired his service, right? Paul was always confident. We are always confident, he says. This all happens through the vehicle of faith, through the means of faith. As Paul trusts Christ through the revealed word of God, the spirit of God in Paul, fueling and firing his faith and his devotion. In other words, Walking by faith, right? Walking by faith involves learning and understanding God, learning and understanding the things that we know from Scripture about Christ. And then not just knowing those things, 
but believing them, trusting them that they are true. Believing, without a shadow of a doubt, that those promises are laid up for you in heaven, right? Believing that the Lord Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And if the Lord Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, then we too will be raised with him, right? It's believing those promises, and then it's committing yourself to live in light of those things, right? When you live in light of unseen and eternal things in the heavens, then the things of this world grow strangely dim, pale in comparison, The afflictions that we face are momentary and light. Walking by faith, by the strength that God's Spirit supplies, supplies, in accord with God's Word, frees Paul up to wear out his tent in the cause of Christ, right? Just wears it out. Frees him up to live for Christ, heart, soul, mind, and strength in the ministry that he's been called to. We need to, we need to get a taste of that, right? <laughs> we want to live for Christ that way. If you're a genuine Christian, you have that heart in your breast, right? I want to live wholeheartedly for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to serve him heart, soul, and mind, and strength. Sometimes, as Pastor Rick was talking about this morning, you can lose sight of your first love. Maybe that becomes a dull-heartedness or an apathy or an indifference. Recognize that, brother. Recognize that, sister. Repent of it. Love the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to live for the Lord in that way. And Paul gives us examples here in this text of how we do that. Practically. This is very, this is intensely practical. I want you to see four ways in our text in which Paul's theology impacts his faith. Paul's determined to walk by faith. That's what Christians do. But as Paul is walking by faith, Paul, one, has a bold trust. A bold trust, verses 6 and 7. Secondly, Paul exemplifies a bold hope, verse 8. Has his eyes fixed on a bold and confident hope. Thirdly, Paul expresses here in the text a bold ambition. A bold ambition. Fourthly, we see Paul's bold motivation in verse 10. A bold trust, bold hope, bold ambition, bold motivation. Those points are in your worship folder. We have to walk by faith, right? We have to walk by faith. That's what Christians do, but then it behooves us to encourage and exhort one another to continue that walk by faith. Grip good theology, right? Grip This good testimony of God, let it fuel your faithfulness. Let it drive your devotion as you preach the gospel and minister to God's people. One, let's begin with Paul's bold trust in verses 6 and 7. Paul's bold trust, verses 6 and 7. He says in verse 6, So we are always confident, always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith not by sight. Now note first Paul's confidence in verse 6. Paul's confidence. God's word, his law, his testimonies, his promises, God's word, Paul's theology forms the basis. It's the granite slab on which Paul can be supremely, unwaveringly, and uncompromisingly confident. And not only Paul, right, Not only Paul, but the Corinthians. Notice that little word, we, in verse 6. He's speaking of the the Corinthians specifically, but us by implication. All of those who name the name of Christ are included in that we. We are always confident based on this theology. That little word, so, that begins verse 6, connects us to what comes before. Namely, namely God's promise of the resurrection promise regarding the resurrection from the dead. That truth is referenced all the way back in chapter 4, verse 13. Look at chapter 4, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Like the author of Psalm 116, we believe, we have faith, Right? And therefore, we are moved, we are exercised, compelled to speak. Having the same spirit of faith, we preach the gospel. 
Just like the author to Psalm 116, we preach Christ and Him crucified despite the difficulty. Because, verse 14, we know that He who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus. For, chapter 5, verse 1, we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we will be raised. Right? The promise of resurrection, the glory of resurrection. We look forward to a glorified body, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In chapter 5, verse 5, that promise of God guaranteed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit's work in my life, the Spirit's work in my ministry is the proof of, that I will be raised, right? It's the pledge. It's the guarantee that we'll be raised in him. All Christians should be able to say that, right? Knowing good theology, reading of Christ in his word, right? Relying upon the Holy Spirit, we should have that confidence. How else are we to respond to such glorious promises, right? These are glorious and eternal promises. We are therefore Always confident. It's not a temporary feeling. It's not a temporary feeling. It's not a a passing emotional high. It's not an occasional mountaintop experience. This is a settled, resolved, and consistent outlook. When you understand God's revelation and you're meditating on those things, it will be a consistent outlook. We are always Confident, based on God's promise, we have a bold trust that doesn't give out. It's a bold trust that is steadfast. The word is thareo. In addition to meaning bold or confident, it also carries the sense of courageous. Right? Courageous. Courage, even in the face of fear. Courage in the face of difficult circumstances. We have a bold, confident, courageous faith. And that's based on the Word of God, based on what we know of Him, what is revealed of Him, right? Paul faced his circumstances with a bold and courageous confidence. We've looked at that before, but the beatings, right, the stoning, the imprisonments, the turmoil, the affliction, the false accusations, losing people around him that were dear to Paul's heart. It was painful for the Apostle Paul, the heartache that came with preaching the gospel and ministering in the Lord's church. Paul faced it all with tremendous confidence. Not in himself, right? This has nothing to do with himself. Paul would have called himself weak, right? An earthen vessel, a nobody, a worm. Paul faced it with confidence in the Lord because of the Lord's word, because of the Lord's promises, because of what the Lord has said is true. And all that courageous, faith-filled confidence is steadfast, verse 6, Even while we know that being at home in this earthly body means that we are absent or away from the Lord. Even knowing that, we are always confident. Then, Paul's unwavering confidence in verse 6 characterizes his conduct in verse 7. Note Paul's conduct in verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Write that little preposition that begins verse 7 introduces a clarifying thought. It's an explanation, okay? Being absent from the Lord while groaning at home in this earthly tent does not mean that we have no fellowship with the Lord. That we are relegated to nothing more than knowledge of these things based on what's been taught to us, so to speak. It doesn't mean that we have no fellowship with the Lord. Paul doesn't mean that we are spiritually separated from Christ. We're physically separated from him for a time, right? Christ said, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Christ is with us. He promises us in John 14, 18 that he will not leave us orphans, that he will come to us by his spirit. No, follow with me Paul's line of thought. Paul is saying here that while we are not physically there with him to see him face to face, we presently live our lives here by faith, not by sight, by faith, believing, believing in him whom we have not seen. 
Paul would essentially say with you and I, I've not put my hand in his side. I've not stretched forth my finger to place it in the scars of his hands. But I know whom I have believed in. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. And the Lord said to Thomas that day after his resurrection, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, right? Peter describes Jesus as the one whom having not seen, we love. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Having not seen him, we treasure him. Because we walk by faith, not by sight. One day, faith will become sight. And we will treasure him face to face. Amen? Now, for the purposes of application, we can draw an exhortation. We can draw a command from verse 7, can't we? And call one another to walk by faith. Walk by faith, brother. Walk by faith, sister. However, notice in verse 7 that verse 7 doesn't describe a command. It's not a command. Verse 7 describes how Christians normally walk. It's how a Christian, a true Christian, walks. The word is meant to describe how we live our lives. That word there, peripateo. Some of your translations translate it live, right? Live by faith, not by sight. Paul is saying we live as an ongoing and continuous habitual pattern. We live by the practice of faith, not by sight, by faith. Not placing, for the normal Christian, for the everyday Christian life, not placing our tr trust, not placing our hope in things that are seen, in things of this world, but rather placing our trust and hope in him whom we have not seen and yet love. Placing our trust, our hope in his word and his promises, right? In other words, the natural man, again, the lost man, the one dead in sin, does not live this way. The natural man does not live this way. He doesn't live day in and day out as a pattern, a continual ongoing pattern of his life, trusting in and looking to the Lord Jesus Christ, believing upon him, obeying his commands, living for him, devoted to him, reading and studying and meditating on his word. The natural man does not live that way. Whereas the Christian born again of God's spirit naturally lives that way naturally hopes in Christ, naturally walks by faith, naturally looks to Christ, right? As a pattern, we live by faith, not by sight. We sometimes need to remind ourselves of that, as Paul does here in verse 7. Walk by faith. Why? Because that's what Christians do, right? Purge out the old leaven. Why? Because you're a new lump. Put off the old man. Why? Because you are already a new man. Put on the new man. Why? Because you are a new man, right? Walk by faith. Why? Because that's what Christians do. We walk by faith, not by sight. Can you see here for Paul why this is no mere blind leap into darkness? Why this is no mystical superstition? Right? Knowledge leaves the room, and that's where state, faith steps in. Right? We put our brains on the shelf. And that's where blind faith comes in. <laughs> no. No. How should we respond? Once you have believed his word, once you have understood, have apprehended, so to speak, God's revelation in his son, how should we respond once you've believed that? The Lord commands all men everywhere to repent and to believe in the gospel. It's the only response worthy of such grace and mercy, right? Paul is confident, walking by faith, in the cause of Christ, even in the face of death. Why? Why? Because Paul's bold trust is grounded in God's immutable and infallible and inerrant word. He believes what the Lord has said of himself. He believes God's word, his law, his testimonies, his promises. His faith grounded in good theology that Jesus Christ 
has been raised from the dead. It's hope in the promise of God that we will be raised with him. And that hope is guaranteed by the presence and work of his spirit within us. It's not that faith steps in when knowledge runs out. It's not a blind leap into darkness. It's based on the truth of God, based on God's word. And that truth verifiable by raising the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead and by the work of God's spirit in the believer. He is our guarantee, our pledge. It's not blind faith in the word of some man, dead and buried, who went into a cave alone and came out with what he said was the word of God and then forced people at the edge of a sword to believe it. It's not the blind faith of Islam, right? It's not the blind faith. It's not blind faith in the word of some man, dead and buried, who looked into a hat at golden plates that only he alone could translate and then came out with what he said was the word of God. It's not blind faith in the word of some man because he has doctor in front of his name or because he's nice, right? It's not blind faith in a group of men, group of men that make up orders of popes and councils and magisterium who have been proven not only to contradict themselves, but to contradict the Bible over and over and over again. It's not blind faith in some charismaniac, faith-healing, tongue-speaking fortune teller. Second Peter 1.19, Peter says this, We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's how the Word of God came about. We have the prophetic word confirmed. If Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead, then God's word is true and every man is a liar. In other words, in other words, we trust God. We live for God. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ on the basis of what he has revealed to be true, right? And walking by faith requires... That all of life is governed by what he has revealed to be true. So knowing what God has revealed to be true, believing what God has revealed to be true, the prophetic word confirmed, in other words, fueled Paul's confidence and drove Paul's conduct. Ultimately, right, Paul could abandon himself entirely to his ministry because he knows that God will not abandon him. Not even in death. He knows what promised glory lays ahead at the end of his rest. At the end of his race. The rest that lays ahead at the end of his race. Paul explains all of this for our admonition. Right? This is not specifically referring to Paul alone. By implication, all of those who would believe in him in Christ through his word. Paul explains all of this for our reproof for our correction, for our instruction in righteousness, we can have and should have the same confidence in all our conduct for the Lord. We should have confidence in our conduct, displayed in our conduct, displayed in our ministry. What does it mean here to live by faith? Right? Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. First, to live by faith, you have to know what to believe. We are to know what we are to believe, and that's the revealed word of God. God's word, we are to know good theology. Romans chapter 10, verse 14, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? We are to know the content of God's revelation concerning his son, we are to believe that Jesus Christ is God the Son, God incarnate, fully God, fully man, sent to the world as God's long-promised Savior to seek and to save that which was lost. 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. We are to believe that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. We are to believe that He, God, made Him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us in our place, that we might become the righteousness, the holiness, right? The perfection of God in Him. What a glorious truth. We know this. We know it because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus Christ was raised the third day according to the Scriptures. Test it out. Look it up. Study it. There's evidences for the resurrection, right? Right? Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just, is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. We're to know what we are to believe. Secondly, living by faith involves believing then that what we know, to be convinced that what we know is certifiably true. It's a, a settled trust in the Word of God. A settled trust in the promises of God, in the person and work of Christ alone for salvation. Paul said, We have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In Him, in Christ, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. In other words, after you have come to the knowledge of what you are to believe, you then put your trust in Him. Right? In Him you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were then sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. It's believing then what we know. It's believing that that is true, a settled trust in the Word of God. Thirdly, living by faith is to then entrust yourself to Him. Committing yourself to Him. Acknowledging the truth is not enough. There are many of those, right, who will admit, believe, and confess. Admit that I'm a sinner. That's a knowledge that I'm a sinner. That doesn't save me. Believe, right, believe that God in Christ has promised salvation to those who put their faith and trust in Christ. Is believing in Christ, confessing your sin. But where is the commitment of life? Where is the repentance? Where is the walking by faith? Right? Even the demons believe, James says, and they tremble in the fear of God. What separates or what distinguishes your so-called faith from that belief or faith of a demon? It's this third piece. Living by faith is then to entrust yourself to him, committing yourself to him. It's the only appropriate response to the one who believes the revealed word of God. It is trusting Christ alone for your salvation. It is then committing yourself to him, heart, soul, mind, and strength, living for him, obeying his commandments, seeking his face, turning from living life for yourself, turning from your sin, turning from your own preferences, your own Worldly desires, turning from that old man to put on the new man, turning to Christ in faith and hope. It's turning from sin to Christ. James Montgomery Boyce, um, I believe it was, uh, told the story as a young man. They worked for the telephone company for a period of time. I believe it was uh, Boyce that said this, that um, he learned really quick. You'd have to climb up the telephone pole, fix the connections. Maybe work on the transformer box. He was working on connecting the lines. And as he would climb those telephone poles, those telephone poles are just filled with splinters and jagged pieces, you know, wood hanging up. So Boyce, when he first started, said as he's climbing up that telephone pole, he would put a strap around himself and the pole 
and start with his hands and feet trying to shimmy up the pole, but he was getting splinters all over his belly, all over his chest, <laughs> trying to climb that pole. He learned very quickly that in order to climb, he had to lean back against the strap. In other words, lean back over the fall, so to speak, right over that distance, trust the strap, lean back so that he could climb. The only way that he could climb is through, if you want to say it that way, faith in the strap, right? John Payton, a 19th century missionary, tells the story of translating the Bible into the language of those people in the South Pacific that he was ministering to. And he had difficulty in their language finding a word for faith. And so he was sitting in his room one day, and some of the local tribes people came in and said something to him along the lines of, you're sitting down today. And so uh, Peyton knew the phrase, and he leaned back in his chair, sort of changed his posture. Then he turned to the man and asked him, now what am I doing? And the man said, well, you're in their language, you're resting your weight on the back of the chair. Peyton was entrusting himself, so to speak, to that chair to hold him up and to support him. And it was that word that he latched on to describe faith in their language in translating the Bible. Do you see? Leaning back in everything that we do, think, say, ministering, preaching the gospel, we're leaning back. On him, committing ourselves to him, entrusting ourselves to him. As we step out in faith to obey his word, we're trusting him that he will supply us with the necessary strength, right? Supply us with what we need. He is the one, Second Corinthians chapter 6, who makes us sufficient for such things. Not we ourselves. We have to lean on him, trusting in him, committing ourselves to him. Three parts of faith. Still relying on the testimony of God's word, Paul's bold trust in Christ leads to a bold hope then in verse 8. Look at Paul's bold hope in verse 8. Paul said in verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We are confident there, beginning of verse 8, simply repeats the thought of verse 6. We are always confident. But there in verse 8, in the New King James Version, there is an untranslated chi, or and, in the New King James. I like the ESV here, where the ESV reads, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. In other words... We are always confident in this life. We're always confident in this earthly house, this tent, this body. We have joy and faith and love and hope and courage. But we would far rather be there with him, right? Heaven would be far better. Notice the theology. Notice the theology. Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. When a Christian dies, he goes immediately to be with the Lord in heaven. You close your eyes in this life and you open them in bliss with the Lord in heaven. Those words in verse 8 are the same words used in verse 6, essentially meaning home and away. While we're home in, in the body, we're away from the Lord, right? We'd much rather be away with the Lord. In other words, in other words, there's no in between, in between place. There's no in-between state where we are absent from the body and also absent from the Lord. Do you see? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This truth, verse 8, destroys any notion of purgatory. There is simply no such thing. It is a figment of man's imagination. Purgatory is a place where a believer goes, a believer, where a believer goes after death, To be purified through suffering, who knows how long, a thousand years, two thousand years, five thousand, it depends on how much money they want from you to get them out of purgatory, right? (laughs) Wicked false teachers. This place where a believer goes after death to be purified through suffering before he can enter heaven, 
It's a false doctrine that is nowhere in the Bible against the teaching of Roman Catholicism. This truth, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, destroys any notion of soul sleep, a state wherein a believer remains unconscious after death in a perpetual sleep until Jesus comes back. Again, a false doctrine that is nowhere in the Bible destroyed by the truth expressed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. It's against the teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses and other cults. The text is clear. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus told the penitent thief on the cross, didn't he, that today you will be with me in paradise. But notice here in verse 8 that he didn't mention any of the other blessings of heaven, right? He didn't say, absent from the body is to be there with the streets of gold. <laughs> absent from the body is to swim around in the crystal sea. <laughs> nope. Absent from the body is to experience all the pleasures of heaven. No, no. He desires to be absent from the body for the preeminent and supreme joy of being in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, where our faith becomes sight because we shall see him face to face as he is. Right? That's the bold hope of every true Christian. You know, before the Lord saved me, I um, was a lost man sitting in churches. And one of the evidences that later became crystal clear proof that I was on my way to hell during that time was the fact that the only reason I really wanted to go to heaven is because I didn't want to go to hell. Because I feared hell. I really didn't care one way or the other, whether or not Jesus Christ was going to be there. That wasn't what I was looking forward to. I wanted to escape hell. And the idea that in heaven, that heaven would be made up of the worship for all eternity of the Lord Jesus Christ appealed not to me. <laughs> Are we going to be in church for eternity? <clears throat> That was an evidence that I was lost. Right? Every genuine believer, the bold hope of every genuine Christian is to one day be absent from this body and to be present with him. Paul is essentially saying this. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. Just flip over a little bit to the right here. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 19. Paul is essentially saying this. Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. Paul is imprisoned in Rome, although he has suffered there in Rome. Paul writes to the Philippians with great confidence that God will deliver him, even if it means his death. Look at verse 19. Paul says, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, you could say with all confidence, right? As always, so now also, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. It's a strong statement, isn't it? That's a bold statement. Notice in verse 20, Paul's earnest expectation and hope is that in nothing I shall be ashamed. And that's not, that's not a, an empty hope, is it? Because we serve the Lord Christ. You can face the derision and scorn of this world knowing that in nothing you will be ashamed. You can face their false accusations. You can face that persecution knowing that we're not ashamed of the gospel. In nothing will we be ashamed. God will glorify us. That's not an empty hope. The world may heap scorn upon us, but in nothing we shall be ashamed. That led Paul to great boldness for Christ. Whether he would exalt Christ in life through his ministry or 
or exalt Christ in death, he didn't know. But Christ will be magnified in my body, Paul says, verse 20, whether by life or by death. Whether I live or whether I die, Christ will be exalted. One thing he did know, verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is to serve Christ, heart, soul, mind, and strength. To die is to be in the presence of Christ, right? Great gain. All the things of this world, wealth, status, power, possessions, health, a retirement account, right? Prosperity, the boat, all of it, all of it is passing away. Paul says, to live is Christ. That is a powerful statement, right? Meditate on that for just a minute. To live your breath, your life, your energy, your physical ability, your mind, your prowess, your strength, your imagination, your desires, your hopes, your dreams, your work, your labor, your toil, your prayer. All of it is to be for Christ. To live is Christ. However, Paul says, I would be well pleased rather to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. To die is gain. Verse 22, if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two. Right? Paul Essentially to the Philippians, I love you, but I really want to go home. (laughs) I would really rather be at home with the Lord, right? Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you, Philippians. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith. That your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Paul's bold hope, both here, Philippians chapter 1, and back in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, is to be with the Lord. John Owen had many insightful things to say on this subject. Listen to this from Owen. He says, the hearts of believers are like the needle touched by the lodestone which cannot rest until it comes to the point whereunto, by the secret virtue of it, it is directed. For being once touched by the love of Christ, receiving therein an impression of secret, ineffable virtue, they will ever be in motion and restless until they come unto him and behold his glory. That needle vibrating until finally... Finally, it finds its rest in him, beholding his glory. Owen says, that soul which can be satisfied without it, that cannot be eternally satisfied with it, is not partaker of the efficacy of his intercession. It's not a Christian. Owen gives a warning. No man shall ever behold the glory of Christ by sight hereafter, who doth not in some measure behold it by faith here in this world. We are to see the glory of Christ by faith. Christ as revealed in God's holy word. Persons not disposed hereby unto it cannot desire it. Whatever they pretend, they only deceive their own souls in supposing that so they do. Most men will say with confidence, living and dying, that they desire to be with Christ and to behold his glory. But they can give no reason why they should desire any such thing. Only they think it somewhat is better than to be in that evil condition, which otherwise they must be cast into forever, hell, when they can be here no more. If a man pretend himself to be enamored with or greatly to desire what he never saw nor was ever represented unto him, he doth but dote on his own imaginations. And the pretended desires of many to behold the glory of Christ in heaven, who have no view of it by faith whilst they are here in this world, are nothing but self-deceiving imaginations. As we walk by faith, not by sight, 
We are to behold the glory of Christ revealed to us on the pages of Scripture. You know, we see now in a mirror dimly, but we are to behold his glory as revealed to us and look forward, anticipating, hastening the day when our faith becomes sight and we see him face to face. Paul continues to give the basis for this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9 then. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. That's the response of faith, is it not? To be well-pleasing to him. For what we know, that good theology informing our confidence, informing our conduct, for, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We'll look at those verses next week. All praise, honor, and glory right? to God who reveals such things to us that we might behold his glory. Amen. Let's take a few moments and pray. And I want us to pray that if you're here today and you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, then pray that the Lord will fire and fuel our faith with, a, with this knowledge, right, that, that Paul is expressing in, this, in these verses, um, and that believing those things to be true, we would commit ourselves to preaching the gospel and serving one another as he has called us to, to commit ourselves to that ministry. If you're here today, and this just doesn't resonate with you, you... Don't relish the thought of spending an eternity worshiping Christ forever in heaven. He's not your bold hope. And pray that the Lord would be pleased to glorify himself in breaking your heart over your sin and save you for his worship. 